Okay, good evening, everybody. I got some pretty good stories to tell us here with the ACA. I hope I can entertain you as much as they have. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the battle, what I've called the histories of the Battle of Lake Erie. Now, the Battle of Lake Erie was one of the most pivotal battles in American naval history. Our border with Canada in that region was set on that day, where it remains to this one. As I learned all the events leading up to this battle, I was instantly struck by all of its multifaceted aspects. Complicatedly intertwined within its story are great stories of heroism, valor, skill, luck, cowardice, bravery, but not necessarily in that order, nor not necessarily where you think they might belong. During these histories, I will be looking at three men who all played pivotal parts in this battle. Commodore Oliver Hazard Perry, which you probably have heard of, American history is, seems to have loved him. A man named Jesse Duncan Elliott, who American history seems to have forgot. And a Lieutenant Robert Hero Barclay a man American history never even considered. Now history is written by the victors, or so they say, so we'll start there. And America loves a winner. The accepted story of the Battle of Lake Erie, the story that you probably learned in high school, leaves a whole bunch of the story missing. But it's still a great story, as well as a very true story. The factual parts of Oliver Hazard Perry's story are so riveting that they don't need any of the embellishments or confusions that the press or later historians might have put on them. As I tell this story, you need to realize, though, that this isn't the history of the Battle of Lake Erie. This is just his story. Now, Oliver Hazard Perry was fraught to Commodore on February 22nd of 1813. Now he had been in the Navy since he was 13 years old. He was actually trained by his father. He was his father's midshipman. Now he was the oldest of three brothers who would each become accomplished naval officers in their own right. In fact, his 13 year old little brother, Alexander, was his midshipman at the Battle of Lake Erie. But by making Commodore just 28 years of age, Oliver outshined them all. Now his orders were to go to Lake Erie so he could superintend building a fleet to operate on the lake. Now a man named Daniel Dobbins, who I could do another whole history on, actually scouted the perfect place to build the fleet. It was a naturally protected harbor known as Presque Isle. Now the British essentially owned Lake Erie at the beginning of 1813. They had already taken the city of Detroit as well as several other places. When they took Detroit, all they did was just parade Tecumseh's warriors around the front of the city, and it scared the crap out of like a 2,000 man garrison, and they only had like a 1,000 guys. But the British had also commandeered just about every ship on Lake Erie that they could mount a gun on. The British essentially owned Lake Erie when Perry got there. And the Americans only had one ship on it, and that was the Caledonia, which we'll discuss later. Now on March 26th of 1813, Perry arrived in Lake, at Lake Erie through a difficult trek through almost constant lake effect snowstorm. Approximately 150 ship's carpenters came from New York, and as well as sail makers, riggers, who came from Philadelphia. Now there was only one large building available, and that was the courthouse that, in the southwest corner of what is now called Perry Square. That was where they cut and assembled all the sails. And by April of 1813, Perry's fleet in the wilderness was beginning to take shape. The Tigers and the Porcupine were launched in May, and then the next month, the Scorpion was launched at the beginning of June. And as they built those, they were also building two big 
20 gun frigate or 20 gun brig. One, which was named the Niagara for the lake and the river. The other was called the Lawrence. Now, out in Boston Harbor on June 1st of 1813, there was a Navy captain named James Lawrence who took his frigate, the Chesapeake, out into Boston Harbor to do, duel with the British frigate Shannon. Now, this was supposed to be a simple one-on-one -on -one battle, but it ended up being a disaster for Lawrence. After a very short battle, Lawrence lay dying amid the wreckage of his ship. As he shouted his last words to anybody that would listen, blow her up, burn her up, but don't give up the ship. Don't give up the ship before he died. Well, Perry and Lawrence had grown up together and they were the best of friends. So he, so in homage to his bud, he named his flagship the Lawrence. And he also commissioned a battle flag white and blue, emblazoning these five words into American naval history. Don't give up the ship. Now the Brig Lawrence was launched into Presque Isle Bay on June 25th, followed by her identical twin sister, the Niagara, on July 4th. Now the British blockaded the harbor and tried to keep them in the confines of Presque Isle Bay for, as long, for most of a whole month. The fleet was stuck in there and unable to sail. But at the beginning of August, the British dropped their guard and disappeared. So on August the 2nd of 1813, the Lawrence was kegged to the entrance of Presque Isle, Isle Channel. The Niagara was moored nearby, ready to defend, and the Lawrence was stripped of all her cannon, all her heavy material, and all her ballast. And the field ba battery on Garrison Hill was also put on alert, because as they brought the ships over the sandbar with, on the camels, they were sitting ducks. Now camels are oblong barges. They're 90 feet wide, long, they're 40 feet wide, and they're six feet deep. And they had two holes cut in the center of them. What they did was they fill them up with water, move them underneath, they'd run uh, poles through the ship, and then they pump the water out and actually lift the ship up over the bar to get it over and then drop it down. It took most of two days to get the Lawrence out into Lake Erie, floated safely over the sandbar. But by early morning of August 4th, she was finally towed to an anchorage just outside the harbor. And by 2 p.m., they had everything replaced on the ship. They fired a salute. The Lawrence was ready for battle. Lightning the Niagara went quickly. It only took a few hours to get everything on the beach. The camels were towed into place, and by August the 5th, less than 24 hours later, the Niagara was over the bar and equipped for battle as well. Now his total crew on, crews on his nine ships was like 532 men, but sickness had been so prevalent that only about six, 416 of them were actually fit for duty. In fact, Oliver Hazard Perry himself was actually almost incapacitatedly ill in the days right before the Battle of Lake Erie. So to augment some of his sickly men, General Harrison loaned them a bunch of Kentucky sharpshooters. They cruised the islands of Put-in Bay right north of uh, oh, Cleveland and waited for the British fleet to come out, which they did on September 10th of 1813. Now Perry set his battle line with the Ariel and Scorpion a little bit ahead of Perry's ship, the Lawrence. The next came the Caledonia, then after her, the Niagara, under Captain Jesse Duncan Elliott. The Niagara was followed by the Summers, the Porcupine, the Tigers, and the Trip. As the British approached them, Perry ordered all the Kentucky riflemen up into the rigging of his ship and ordered them to take out every British officer that they could find on every range ship. The British had six ships. The Chippeway, the brand new 300 ton brig Detroit, the mid size hunter, and another full brig, the Queen Charlotte, the Lady Prevost, and the Little Bell. Perry was confident that he was up against the best the British had to offer. As the fleets closed, the wind was with the British, and they could hear the song Rule Britannia wafting across the wave as the greatest naval power in the world at that time bore down upon them. 
And at noon, on September 10th of 1813, the light and contrary winds of war shifted to the American advantage. Perry's ship got full billows and took right on. When the Lawrence got within half a mile, the British fired a raining shot, which missed him by just yards. The second shot, however, tore through the Lawrence's rigging, and she could only be steered by her rudder. As the Lawrence left all her sisters in her way, both the HMS Detroit and the Hunter started pounding shells into her. Braving all that fire, Perry's ship pulls right up alongside the Detroit, and the Lawrence hammers into the Detroit with a full carronade broadside. The Detroit responds again with every gun she has left, and the Lawrence answers them back again. The two ships continue pounding each other. Boom! Boom! Up in the mass of the Lawrence, the Kentucky sharpshooters start taking out every British officer they can on every range ship they can hit. The Queen Charlotte, their second largest ship, now passes the Hunter and starts throwing a whole carronade broadside at the Lawrence. Now the Lawrence is fighting battle of three to one, and it's getting completely hammered in the process. Way overcome by the Lawrence's firepower, the Detroit lies now almost silent. But the Queen Charlotte, however, continues to pound full, full broadsides right into the Lawrence. Without any wind to move or change their position, the four ships were stuck there in a desperate battle. Perry ship fights until almost 80% of her crew are casualty, until all but one of her guns are dismounted. The Commodore himself jumps down to the gun, gun deck, helps to load that last cannon, helps to load it out, orders it fired, and when it gets fired, boom, the whole cannon just drops right off the blocks, and the Lawrence was now stuck, defenseless, no way to shoot back anymore. Perry goes back up to the bridge of the ship, and he notices the unengaged Niagara off into the distance. Well, why hadn't she come up? Why hadn't she engaged with the Queen Charlotte that was blasting the crap out of his ship? By this time, the Lawrence was almost destroyed, and none of her guns worked, and she was listing quite badly. Now, tied off to the stern of the Lawrence was a rowboat. So Oliver Hazard Perry pulls down his don't give up the ship flag, orders his most able and senior bodied officer, oh, most able bodied and senior officer, to hang on for as long as they can, grabs his little brother and about six seamen who were still able to row, and rows under full view and fire of the British the whole way over to the Niagara. Commodore Perry climbs on board the Niagara and after a very brief verbal exchange with their commander assumes command of the Niagara. The Captain Elliot on the Lawrence quickly volunteers to row out to all the smaller vessels and urge them into the fight. So Elliot climbs aboard the rowboat and he rows away. Perry's watching the Lawrence get blasted from a distance and his heart sinks when he sees the Lawrence finally strike her colors. And then all of a sudden, poof! The light and contrary winds of war again shift to the American advantage. The Niagara goes to full sail. Perry sets his battle flag to the breeze as the Niagara bears down to avenge her sister ship, as well as the man that Perry named her for. As Perry approaches the British line, the Detroit and the Queen Charlotte try to face her fresher broadsides to their rapidly closing enemy. But as the two British ships attempt to come about, their rigging become hopelessly entangled. Perry orders that both broadsides of carronades to be double shotted and ready to fire at his order as the Niagara breaches the British line and begins crossing the team. Perry orders fire and 36 32 pound cannonballs thundered out in unison from both sides of the Niagara. One of those broadsides practically destroyed the hunter at port and stopped from the sharp starboard side simultaneously right both the Detroit and the Queen Charlotte from stems to stern. He ordered a second shot, he ordered a second round to be loaded and fired, and the battle was over. With the damage had the British had received after the breach of their line, the battle itself was over in 15 minutes. The two of the smaller British ships tried to escape, but they were quickly captured. The Battle of Lake Erie was over, and Perry had captured an entire British squadron. At the instance of his first relaxation, he jots a letter to General Harrison on the back of an envelope. 
that has also become a mantra of American naval history. We have met the enemy and they are ours. Two ships, two brigs, one schooner and one sloop. Yours with great respect and esteem, O.H. Perry. Up to this time, the War of 1812 had become stagnant and the Americans needed a victory. Andy here, and with Oliver Hazard Perry, they got both. This was the first time in history that an entire British squad, naval squadron had ever been captured in battle. And over the years, the story of Oliver Hazard Perry and the Battle of Lake Erie has become one of the grandest standards in American naval history. But as I said at the beginning of my history, this isn't the history of the Battle of Lake Erie. That's just his story. 